please go ahead thank you a very good evening everyone myself dr martina on the behalf of dentist online channel i welcome you all to the world implant expo 2021 we conduct webinar courses uh, on different various different and various aspect of dentistry please do follow follow us on instagram and facebook for the further information and today's topic is um, interproximal root spreading in case of narrow space at the end of the discussion uh, end of the discussion there will be a question answer session you can leave your question in the question answer box so we will be uh, answering that question at the end of the session so uh, i welcome our speaker dr maro maricola a Arden doctor with impeccable skills and clinical acumen dr maro maricola graduated in 1988 at las francia university rome and received in 1990 his italian and german doctor degree in dentistry and dental processes he received in 1998 his master degree in somatology with focus on implant dentistry from the center research and postgraduate study academy of medical academy of dentists in germany currently serve as a clinical director of international center of oral implantology and professor at dental school university columbia he also served as a visiting professor in so many universities like Beijing University, Ninjang University, University of Levin, University of Rome, and Verona. Since 1998, in charge as a scientific research coordinator for Bicon, Boston, MA, he is a co-developer of initiative surgical restorative technique of Bicon implant system together with Dr. Vincent Morgan, IBC, Boston. Dr. Maricola is a author and coder of numerous scientific articles in international dental journals. Lectures ext extensively in Europe, Asia, USA, Latin and South America on dental implant related topic. The experience he has put in the field is unmatchable. Now, may I request Maricola, Dr. Maricola to take over the session. Dr. Please. Thanks a lot, Mar uh, Martina. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. It's our pleasure, uh, sir. And thanks for the invitation, for sure, because it's always nice to <clears throat> to talk with uh, with uh, a lot of people worldwide. And uh, um, I am uh, pleased uh, to be here once again. Uh, I know you from uh, only from a few minutes ago but uh, my good friend melvin uh, mendonca who is part of the organizing uh, committee is always uh, nice with me and uh, i was uh, pleased to be part of uh, of your uh, of your international uh, world congress and uh, here we are now i'm talking uh, with you from germany actually because uh, i'm normally practicing in in Roma in Rome and Italy uh, but I'm lecturing very often in Germany too and we are actually right in the middle of a congress and uh, fortunately I finished my my lecture 10 minutes ago otherwise I wouldn't sit here with you and uh, the the topic uh, today is uh, very interesting can be very interesting for for many countries uh, where there are a lot of young uh, people and uh, the population is different to our European old uh, population. Uh, the congenitally missing teeth is, uh, is, an, uh, is a nightmare in, in different countries. I'm working also, uh, as uh, Martina told you, in different other places uh, in, uh, in Asia and in South America where the problem is bigger than it's here even if i have very often patients in italy young patients uh, with uh, agenesis uh, in the upper anterior uh, where the implant placement becomes very very uh, challenging because uh, in that place uh, in uh, in the upper anterior very often after genesis uh, uh, we have uh, only few bone remain where uh, we can place implants and uh, often the, the question is what we shall do 
even after um, orthodontic treatment, we can't get the, the right, uh, the right, uh, let's see, the right um, bone quantity uh, to place uh, standard implants. And so what happened is uh, uh, in the last years, the uh, narrow implant came out and narrow implant can narrow implants really help us in that situation and we will question it now and then i will show you uh, not only literature review but some uh, clinical cases where you can see if, uh, uh, if we can have an answer for it <clears throat> and so the most important is uh, to know what is the classification of uh, a narrow diameter implants uh, we have uh, category one, as you see, which are the ones less than three millimeters of diameter. Then the category two is between 3.25, three, point, uh, 25, three uh, and uh, 3.25, and category three is between 3.25 and 3.5 millimeter diameter. So we have this three categories, and but as we can we can see in uh, in our literature review. Uh, Schlegnitz and, um, and Navas uh, did that beautiful um, meta-analysis on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on a big uh, number of uh, literature. And they discovered that in effect, uh, uh, category one is not really indicated for uh, long-term restorations in that area. They are not uh, real. Uh, called as a final implants, but mostly as transitional implants. And so less than three millimeters is still a problem uh, for the long-term results. And uh, meanwhile, category two and three, uh, they, they are as the same, they have they had the same result as we could have for the standard diameter implants where the category two were mostly placed in the upper anterior places in the upper anterior where we have uh, uh, our agenesis uh, problems where we have uh, a very thin crest thin, thin bone of even so with special techniques which you will see we could have very nice results the category three is uh, it's it's really uh, it's like a uh, similar to the uh, standard diameter implants and narrow uh, ridges even in the posterior the 3.5 diameter implants worked very well long term and that gives a, it gives us a, a, the chance to uh, to include narrow implants inside uh, uh, our uh, treatment plan <clears throat> what is the literature saying you know, at the glance uh, we will see um, I did an, uh, a summary of what the uh, literature is, is telling us and what are they telling us that in case we have a minimum distance a mesodistal distance and buccal oral uh, distance uh, we should always maintain and keep the implants one implants close to another not closer than three millimeters that is literature review it is not the reality for all implant designs okay i will tell you that because uh, it is what the literature is saying and what is generally happen keep three millimeter distance between one and the other implant then between implant and addition tooth keep 1.5 to 2 millimeter distance all right so let's say the ideal distance is 1.5 and not less than 1.5 millimeter but we will see that there are exceptions where we can go very close to the adjacent tooth depending on for sure the geometry of the implant and the way where the implant how the implant is placed screwed or tapered there is a big difference in between uh, these two techniques so then these numbers can be also changed and we will see it uh, but the important thing is that generally the standard imp diameter implants and even though the the uh, narrow implants they have they they have to maintain a certain distance because of what because of having then as a final result 
the right space for the soft tissue, for the papilla growing, or for the soft tissue generally, for the soft tissue emergence profile. Because if we occupy the space which has to be occupied by the soft tissue, we will never achieve papillas or a healthy soft tissue around this implant. So the spacing is very important in the literature reviews also with the narrow implants. And so if we see and look at it, in case of reduced uh, buccal palatal bone volume, uh, which means less than five millimeters, the literature tells us that generally grafting procedures should be followed before we place an implant. Grafting procedures is a little bit more complex compared to splitting techniques or expansion techniques. And so keep in mind that there are, yes, uh, uh, there can be uh, certain, certain uh, techniques can be achieved, but is it always necessary to do a bone grafting technique, which is much more difficult to achieve from a technical standpoint, but it's also uh, not as reliable as we use, for example, the splitting technique or the expansion technique, because the last two techniques, they work with the, uh, with the original bone, let's see, with the native bone. Okay, we're working on a native bone. Meanwhile, the bone grafting procedures required bone from donor sites. And as we can see in this case, there must be a bone grafting procedure uh, to repair that kind of defect. And this is the only defect, the class 4b from Caldwell Howell, which tells us <clears throat> that in this case where we have a fusion of the two, two corticals, there is no other way than bone grafting with autogenous bone or with other uh, with other techniques. But I will tell you and I will show you which is the most predictable for sure. And uh, but uh, the class 4b is mostly appearing in cases where we have edentulous eventually, eventually cases, uh, long term edentulous cases or when we had a traumatic ex extraction because of granuloma, present, the presence of granulomas or cysts. And then after the healing, we have a very thin crest like you can see on, uh, on our image here on the picture. Uh, with a class 4A, we can opt for the splitting and we can opt for the expansion. And so there are, <clears throat> it has to be clear when it's a must to go over with a, with a, and to treat with a, a bone grafting procedure and when it's not really necessary. <clears throat> the most predictable, but also the most difficult <laughs> procedure is the Curie box technique, which uh, consists in, in, in taking a donor bone from the ramus, split them in two parts, it's easy to tell, but it's difficult to, to achieve. And uh, screw them, uh, one part, one chip on the buckle, the other chip on the palatal part. And everything which is between the two chips must be autogenous bone. It can't be synthetic bone. Otherwise, it will not work. But the results are ex excellent. But there are also, for that kind of procedure, limitations. No? As we can see, uh, the, the difference between class B and uh, class 4B and clear class 4A, uh, it's, it's obviously to see. You know, if you have a class 4A, like uh, uh, on the screen on the right side, so we can do expansion and place our narrow implants. And, but if it's a fusion class 4B, uh, we need to do that procedure, which is giving us excellent results, that's for sure, but it's difficult to achieve. And it's also limited by the dimension once again. This time it's not the buckle oral dimension, but 
the mesodistal distance between the two natural teeth and the roots mostly because as you see on the left side the critical space for a bone graft is if you have only two three four millimeters uh, between the, the roots and so we can't really place that chips uh, in that very narrow space uh, but meanwhile, this is, for example, the result of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the case I showed you before with the x-rays. And so you see that uh, if you have space, mesodistal space, which is here, for example, a canine area, there is always a lot of space. But with the uh, lateral incisor of the centrals, it will be very, very difficult to follow up with such a procedure. The same thing is with the uh, uh, GBRs. No? Uh, the membrane needs space. And so it's difficult then to, to fix them in an area where there's no roots. So it becomes a, a very tricky uh, procedure. So back to the, to the roots. No? Let's go back to the roots. So what they're saying is true. No? That's, uh, that's from the literature. It's from, from taken simply from internet. There are so many graphics showing that you must keep the distance of 1.5 millimeters between the natural tooth and the implant and uh, the same for the transmucosal supracrestal transmucosal have the same distance parameters keep 1.5 millimeter distance but finally <clears throat> if you look at um it, it will become very very tricky you know because then back to the literature I say keep five minute distance between the na neighbor tooth and the neighbor roots and then minimum five then if i place a three millimeter diameter implant in that area i still don't have the 1.5 millimeter distance between the roots and the implant so it will be a little bit narrower. And so it's a compromise. And so I diminish what generally the protocol should be, keep one and a half millimeters distance. And so if you do that, then you need three millimeters, but plus three, at least a six millimeter distance between the neighbor roots. And that's it's a little bit controversy what you find in, in the literature, keep five millimeters, but then keep 1.5 millimeter distance between implant and root and then if you if you do a little simple mathematics you know 1.5 plus 1.5 is 3 plus 3 millimeter diameter of implant is 6 and so there's something wrong and then uh, the implant should be narrower than we suppose uh, with a 3 millimeter should be narrower but then it comes back to the category 1 where uh, the narrow 2.2, 2.3 millimeter implants are not for uh, for a final restoration, but only for temporization or temporary implants. So palatal, bucopalatal, it's the same thing. Um, yes, five millimeters, but then uh, I, pay, I place a three millimeter implant and then I am not away one and a half millimeter from the cortical. Uh, this is less critical than being very close to the periodontal ligament for sure. Uh, it's less critical, but it can cause a phenomena which is called pressure necrosis. And so as closer I go to the bicorticals, screwing the implant between two corticals, as more I can have the risk of pressure necrosis. Where I don't have the pressure necrosis for sure is uh, in the cancerous bone, but they can also have a compression on the periodontal ligament, like we see on the x-rays to implants which failed uh, because of compression, the pressure and the necrosis was too tight, too evident and uh, causes uh, uh, this resorption of the bone uh, generally, which is then uh, followed by failure of the implant. So, <clears throat> Here we are, pressure necrosis in threaded implants. So let's pay attention uh, what the torque uh, we should give to this kind of implants, less or more. And then it becomes a critical technical problem. <clears throat> but be aware, don't go too close like in the x-ray to the natural roots if you use screw 
uh, retained implants. What we have, we have the alternative to change the geometry and to avoid the screwing of the implants into the bone, avoiding a compression initially, uh, the first week mostly, uh, of compression of the bone, that's physiology of the bone around screw, uh, screw retained implants. It's not what that I have to tell you uh, how it works, you know it very well. And uh, now we have <clears throat> something else which is called press fit implant. It's not screwed in, it's pressed into an osteot osteotomy which is made in a very special way. And this is the title of my lecture, and that's sort of interproximal root spreading. So that means there is no real cutting moment of a burr, but there's only a compression in between the roots to find then the space for a plateau formed implant, which is a subcrestal implant. It's placed two to three millimeter, mostly in that area, sometimes even four millimeters under the crest. Because of, we will see, two objects can't occupy the same space. And so because of that, and we'll see that a three millimeter implant of this implant design at the end, at the cortical where it's important to have bone, the implant is not there. There is only a shaft which is in contact with the post, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the, a connection of the implant. And so we have this shaft which is only two millimeter of diameter. And so it's a real platform switching between the neck of the implant and then the post or the shaft of the abutment and so we have this platform switching which give us the chance to have less space occupied by the titanium by the implant or by the abutment <laughs> so the double platform switching is, is something very interesting important invented uh, by tom driscoll uh, we think about uh, dear Tom, dear Tom, Tom died uh, unfortunately uh, a month ago, the inventor of Bicon and of many other uh, devices worldwide. Uh, he was a great engineer, inventor, uh, and he invented this kind of implant too in, uh, the, <laughs> in the 90s, 1900s. Uh, 68 was the first project and then 1900, 1985 uh, the implant was uh, was then be, became public and was uh, sold uh, worldwide and it's important <laughs> to know that this is a real uh, original design there are many copies of it yeah for sure but uh, the original is always the original i wouldn't buy a, a fake rolex because that Rolex is not working so, so long as you expect. And so that's uh, always the same thing. Now, there's original, there are fake things. But the original one is, <coughs> is 35 and more years old. And so I'm talking about things we know for many years, it's nothing new. And this is what we know for many years. We can, we can uh, get with these implants in touch with the corticals without having pressure necrosis because it's only a touching the cortical. And so we can expand these corticals from two to five millimeters expansion with special procedures, which you will see in the first case. And so expand, place the implant in this expanded bicortical and let the corticals seats over the implant surface where there is no real surface, there are only plateaus, there are only edges. And between the edges is an empty space called healing chamber. And in this healing chamber, chamber the blood club will collect it, will be collected. And so the bone is a complete different environment uh, compared to screw retained implant systems. And also the compression on the osteotomy 
balls are almost zero. Yeah, it's only a few points which are the edges, the external edges of each plateau, which has a tight retention with the osteotomy balls. But then there is no real surface compression on the whole uh, <clears throat> on the whole, whole osteotomy wall and we can see it here here in the comparison of the histology i always saying that screw retained implants are uh, um, involved by a vertical um, <clears throat> vertical bone formation okay and they are squeezed into that bone formation and, and uh, the bone is in a positional bone it's not very reactive and this is nothing what i'm telling this is what you find on the histology of many screw retained implants it's it's a, a very tough bone yes for sure but there is no muscularization this is uh, the limit of it meanwhile you see in the plateau front implants, you will have inside the healing chambers a woven bone, a so trabecular bone, reactive bone, which is similar, similar, it's the same as the bone around, around the implant and around uh, the natural teeth. Doesn't change a lot, reacts the same, is vascularized, has haversian channels, everything which is the characteristic of a bone a trabecular bone a reactive bone and that changes completely uh, the environment of this implant placed inside the bone so that uh, makes the, the implant uh, uh, so um, uh, versatile in, in implant placement wherever you want to place it it's possible to place as soon you know about their characteristics that's very important to 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 know to understand that it is a different design with different outcomes and that different outcomes gives up that opportunity that congenitally missing teeth and lateral incisor for example very 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 common in, in, uh, in many countries and i took that uh, article from patil uh, it's an Indian uh, publication, and there you see uh, in the uh, population, in Indian population, the incidence is up to five percent in young in the young population. It's a lot. It's a lot. Mostly thinking of of uh, the Indian population, how many there are, and uh, I suppose we have some some uh, hidden statistic also in, in some universities where I'm working with in Verona and Roma. And uh, we have also a, a similar percentage, even if it's not safe, because we try always to save that thing with, uh, uh, um, with orthodontic treatments and then uh, with bone grafting procedures and so. Uh, it's not uh, really um, something which we talk frequently about, it, but it's, 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 a major, it's a major problem in uh, dentistry, mostly in uh, pediatric dentistry, where we have uh, that uh, missing laterals, <clears throat> which is very frequent. And though what happened with the missing laterals, here we have the first case, buccal atrophy. So we have a mesodistal distance is, is there, right? You could place uh, whatever implant, in, uh, a narrow implant, also screw retained, but uh, you have to do the expansion and then it's once again how much do i have to expand if i have only a thickness of two millimeters and i have to place a three millimeter implant and i have to maintain at least one millimeter uh, of space between the two corticals so the expansion will be uh, quite a bit so we have to expand a lot and the risk as more you expand as more you split as more uh, the complications are following that splitting and uh, expansion uh, technique <clears throat> so how much could you expand what is the the expansion uh, capacity of the bone most in the maxilla uh, it, it is it's quite good it's quite good uh, we don't have really studies on it but uh, there are so many uh, doing splitting techniques in that case 
but uh, uh, we have to think also if you do splitting or expansion there are neighbor tools in this case and though it's not a splitting of a dangerous case which is completely different that's a splitting between two roots between two periodontal ligaments and if you do some mistake there uh, you you screw up with one of the neighbor tools so pay attention uh, the expansion can't be uh, five millimeters in, in that kind of case, mostly in, in, in upper laterals where the dimension, the, the, the space is naturally very, very thin. So we have to pay attention in that case. And, <clears throat> and like, like we see here in the images, uh, we don't have uh, a big, uh, um, um, a great possibility to expand because it's almost, almost a class for B, almost, almost a fusion of the two corticals, but uh, if you look uh, very well in the upper uh, upper left, uh, the upper left case, which is uh, your upper right image on the screen, uh, uh, there we see, we see that uh, there is something, there is not a fusion between the two corticals, we can get still between the two corticals and split them. Yeah, but how much, yeah, that's important. So if I have a plateau form press fit implant, I have to expand the three millimeters I need. That's it. I don't need more. Because as I told you, the geometry allows us to lay over the cortical, the implants without a problem. <coughs> <coughs> and here we see uh, the case, Anastasia. It's always the same procedure. Open up, flap only partially on the first four or five millimeters that's it and see the crest and let's start with the expansion expansion with the expansion uh, instruments uh, expanders uh, hand dreamers we have for example hand dreamers we use to expand it and to have a very nice uh, uh, expansion possibility with that instrument because on one side we can cut some bone off which is where we have more bone it will not be buckle, it will not be palatal. And so if you have a device, which is the typical burr, which cuts 360 degrees, it's useless because then you will have defects in, in the buckle and in the palatal. You will lose a lot of bone, but here we don't lose bone. We cut towards the mesial in this case, where we have more bone and we cut only with a 30, with a 30 to 45 degrees uh, movement only the mesial parts and in the same moment we take we go in with that burr which has only one cutting edge and the rest is 270 degree 70 degree round passiveweight uh, uh, burr which is acting like an expander and so you cut the bone off where we have more and 270 degrees we are expanding only <clears throat> which makes the procedure very predictable. Also, we have an autogenous bone out of that bone, even if we don't have a lot of bone, as you saw on the x-ray, but you find always bone if you want, and you can collect it with the right technique, for sure. <clears throat> then once finished with, a, with this hand dreamers and expanders, we place the three millimeter implant by eight millimeter lengths into the osteotomy tap the implant down to the crest what you see that black healing plaque is also the implant inserter normally but this healing plaque is therefore to protect the implant well as you can see uh, the black uh, healing plug is there and then we have some autogenous bone we will pack over or sometimes in defects we have provoked and we had a green stick fracture for example at the buckle it can happen we close it without our, our autogenous bone and that's it and then the periosteum uh, is the natural membrane to heal this uh, this area <clears throat> the other side we see the same similar procedure we get him in with a, with a blade first, which you can't see here, but 
that uh, normally we, we we slide the two corticals and make uh, an insertion for for the uh, pilot drill, which is a, f a two millimeter diameter pilot drill. That's it, and go to to a certain length, not necessarily to the end of the length of the implant, because it's not necessary. We have always the centrimers, which are then once again expanding. And as you see, we start with a 45 degrees angled um, cutting uh, procedure, and then we correct slightly and we bend, we bend, we bend slightly the palatal, the buckle bone, excuse me, uh, outside the original dimension and expand that, that bone to seat then once again the three millimeter implant down to the crest once again two three four millimeters as you see once you cover the implant with the bone the implant is not seen anymore it has nothing to do with the crest only the two millimeter healing plaque and then the future shaft which is always also two millimeter occupy the space at the crest and here we are the one is three millimeter on the crest the, four, the, the other one is four <clears throat> so why it is possible to place that implants so deeply and subcrestally because we have a shaft the shaft is the, the prosthetic part which seats inside the implant well and between implant well and shafts once you tap it in there will be a cold welding this cold welding avoids bacterial sealing uh, avoids <laughs> provokes, avoids bacterial infiltration, and so makes that connection bacterially sealed. So there is no way that bacteria get in or get out of the connection. <clears throat> this is why we can work so deeply under the crest. It's important to have that bacterial seal because many uh, clinicians try to use uh, screw retain implants uh, under the crest, but they, they were loosening the bone, which was over the neck of the implant, because there is no bacterial seal, and there are also micro movements between uh, the implant and the connection. And here uh, we see what what we could achieve. You now the implants really pressed in between the two corticals. Okay, pressed in inside that that uh, narrow space, which was nothing before, and we achieved then the insertion of that two implants right in between the, the crest without, without having a compression on the crest. The preloading period is for sure up to six months. You have to wait a little bit longer in this, with this procedure with the healing. Well, mostly uh, using this narrow implants, you can't expect to open it up after two or three months. <clears throat> they have to uh, ossify and then to be accepted uh, uh, with a slower procedure, healing procedure than than uh, with uh, standard implants. It's the same with, uh, with the ultra short implants. Yeah, you have to wait a little bit longer because very thin, very small implants and uh, the surface has to really uh, heal very well before you uh, can load or preload like in this case so open up the soft, the soft tissue you see once again here is only the, uh, the healing plug to see only the healing plug the rest is bone bone created around the two millimeter healing plug underneath is a three millimeter implant this is the implant platform switching in other cases, we place a six millimeter uh, implant, diameter implant, and then uh, we get out of the three millimeter shaft. So from six, we reduce the space at the crest to three millimeters. And here we do a similar thing from three to two. <laughs> then pro prosthetic procedure, okay, that's a technical thing uh, which I show no normally to the customers. and. In this case, we insert an abutment, we tap the abutment in. Tapping means activating the cold welding uh, of uh, the shaft inside the implant well. Once the cold welding is activated, you can always remove with a rotation force, rotational force with a forcep. The abutments, like you see, I tap them in. I look where the soft tissue margin is, and then you can prepare it extra already, and then insert it once again until you have your uh, 
hemispheric uh, your emergence profile of the abutment and of the temporary crown in this case. And then another advantage is everything you do, you know, big problem in implant dentistry is the excess of, of, uh, of cement. And in this case, we cemented extra already and then we clean up uh, the, the, the excess and uh, there is no problem with the, with the, uh, with the cementation. Just recently, uh, two weeks ago before I, I started travel and, and yeah, my office in Rome, a patient came and we had to remove uh, four of six screw retained implants. It was foreign implant, implants. I, I even don't, don't know the, 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 uh, the, um, the producer of the implants uh, was some Italian implants uh, and uh, there were excess of, of, of cement on, on, on the four implants we removed and also on the two survived implants. They were all excess we removed, it was all cement around it and it, it was a, after three years <laughs> the whole bone left and went away. And in this case, we don't have that excess. <clears throat> we do this extra already in both sides, cement in extra already, place the abutments inside the shafts and the crowns uh, in between the soft tissue uh, flap and let it heal. And that's fantastic. You know? Patient never had before papillas and then you have papillas. And uh, this is because we didn't magic. We used the physiology of the bone and the physiology of the soft tissue. This is what we did with our with our procedure, you know, mostly with the system. And as you can see, you go from three millimeter back, very narrow shaft, two millimeter, and then four millimeters hemispheric and base. So, in order to squeeze the soft tissue uh, in between that area and to have the papilla formation. And the beautiful results uh, can be seen after six months and uh, six weeks uh, of healing. And then uh, with the temporization, then we have uh, the soft tissue healed. And from there on, we can take the impression, take the picture, uh, the, the picture for the color and so on and so on. And then finish then the final crown with some adjustments, uh, a chair side uh, to finalize uh, the, the case finally, uh, which has now more than five years. So we saw her recently. <clears throat> These are the pictures of <clears throat> the five years control. So what are we doing now with the with the opposite uh, there? And in, in the first case you saw, we had measured dist the distance, the roots, the natural roots had a distance of six millimeters and we could do a nice expansion. But now we have the opposite. We don't have we don't have a mesial distal uh, uh, distance between the two roots. Uh, this patient that for years and years, I think uh, eight years or nine years, uh, she told that um, orthodontic treatment was nothing to do, where nothing to do, the roots couldn't be uh, play, uh, positioned in, in a position there where we have at least, if you use once again the literature, five to six millimeters distance is only two. All right, and even with the orthodontic treatment, it is impossible <coughs> to reach that results. And we have several of these cases uh, in our offices, in our universities and worldwide. I see that and I treat them uh, very, very often. Well, they give it to, to me because in, in, in some universities they know that I'm doing uh, this research on, uh, on uh, the narrow spaces. And here it's typical. What are we doing here? It's uh, it's very hard to 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 do something which is uh, traditionally known. Uh, to drill in to that space, it's a crime. We know that. But what else can we do to squeeze a, um, a very narrow implant in between the two roots? Yeah, it's two two point two two point three millimeter distance between the roots, even a two millimeter implant which is not a de uh, like i told you it's not a, per a permanent implant it's a temporary implant wouldn't work because it would be too close even in that case too close to the natural tooth so what is the alternative in that case the alternative is the technique called interproximal root spreading which i developed years ago and now i'm i'm showing it because i wanted to see first 
the positive results after five years and uh, really it's it's exceptional what we can do if we know the physiology also of the periodontal ligament and we know from orthodontic treatments that we can uh, pushing and giving the right compression not squeezing it with a screw <clears throat> but given the right compression to the periodontal ligament the periodontal ligament starts to move in another position and the tooth starts to move it sounds, it sounds uh, funny or in heresy but it is not because this is what uh, what happened also in, in orthodontic treatment uh, with the difference that we are not working directly on the roots but we are working on the coronal part but the push the pressure is is that what the periodontal ligament gets at the apical and we are talking about pressure and not about squeezing and compression it's a quite different thing so what we are having here we have to avoid in this case high speed drilling which is not uh, which is not uh, uh, the case to do that and so high speed drilling is uh, uh, is to avoid and tears from the first moment on we should work with expansion uh, uh, instrumentations or with our uh, the, the one we are using from bike on the hand dreamers the hand dreamers work very well and here you have one of the hand dreamers you see that the hand dreamer is uh, not cylindrical formed but root formed and so that means at the tip the last three years it's not the two or 2.5 millimeter burr it is 1.8 which is very important in this case and this burr, what we are doing with that burr, we push the burr in between the two roots. How we do it, uh, regular expansion is a little bit hard to do with a round instrument, but I told you that with one, with this one, we have one cutting edge and only 270 degrees round surface. So what we do here, we cut in this case where we have more bone which is the palatal aspect as you see there is a lot of buckle palatal bone now but the problem here is the mesodistal distance okay so we go we cut towards the palatal and push the burr into and so we cut through the bone in the right direction all right tapping also tapping it's very important because tapping with that purse, the burr is going there where you don't have the periodontal ligament. It sounds funny, but it avoids, avoids that area, which is a little bit more mineralized. And as so though we are staying inside the cancerous bone, the cancerous bone is smooth. And so that burr goes where it's smoother. That's it. <clears throat> and so we see. We squeeze the, ball, the, the, the burr, first the two, then the 2.5, and then the three millimeter burr in between the two periodontal ligaments of the natural tooth. <clears throat> Implant is inserted. Once again, two to three millimeters under the crest. And here you see once again, very nice uh, in your lower left uh, image. Uh, the platform switching uh, the the hole is a three millimeter osteotomy but then the healing plug is a two millimeter healing plug and over that around that we fill it with autogenous bone coming out of the osteotomy or scratching if you don't have so much bone you scratch it from the surface there and close that gap important otherwise periosteum would grow in and so and then you open up and you have only two millimeter engaged at crest level and mesodistal all the space for our papillas even in a very narrow space like that now here we are once again and radiographically the heating chamber i was talking about empty space so the empty spaces can't press against a wall or against the periodontal ligament and so there is no pressure there is only at the edges of this of these plateaus are the pressure but most of the surface is not compressing it's an empty space waiting for the heating and waiting for the what for the blood blood for sure now, this implant needs blood but also 
uh, bone grafting procedure, they need blood, and everything which is a, a reconstructive uh, procedure needs blood. We need blood because blood heals everything. And here we are, <clears throat> once again, as a root form implant. It's not cylindric, and if you can see it very well, the apex, the last three millimeter of this eight millimeter implant, is not anymore three millimeter at the apex at the end of the apex the plateau the last plateau is 2.5 2.6 then seven eight and then it comes to the three millimeter plateaus which are the uh, the following seven eight uh, getting to the implant neck at crest level but the implant neck is underneath the crest and the implant neck is converting from three to two and here we are once again and over and around the neck as you can see mesodistally bone will grow over that area and we have once again space for the papillas which we'll never achieve with a transmucosal implant design or a supracrestal they would take the space away simply all right <clears throat> so once again, very short uh, the summary of the interproximal root spreading is starting with the hand dreamers, the narrow hand dreamers, starting with the two millimeter, 2.5, two to three millimeters, between one and the other expansion, okay, or a spreading procedure. Uh, the burr should stay there for a couple of minutes at least, if not longer. I keep the burr there after the first procedure, then take it off. I'm waiting normally five minutes because in Italy we are used to drink then an espresso, cappuccino, or something else. And maybe in other countries you can drink a tea meanwhile and wait that the expansion, uh, that the, the uh, the the structures, the vital structures around this uh, this expansion instrument, uh, understand that they have to make space. Now the same is with the three millimeter. Then implant is placed, and <clears throat> after six months, we open up the implant. Healing plug is there, as you can see, and then we use the shafts to get to the implant well and to the connection. A long shaft, as you see, that this is two millimeter diameter shaft, getting down to the connection, abutment is placed, abutment is tapped into. And then here we have another uh, procedure, uh, unlike the ones you saw before, here the abutment is finally tapped, finished, and we take the impression from a, a preformed abutment with a sleeve. Okay, that's a transfer sleeve, which is used also for another transfer sleeve is used to, to produce a, a temporization. And then we see the results with the temporization. And then the insertion of the final crown after soft tissue healing, and you see that the papilla start to grow from the first step with the temporization where they were a black hole to the healing where the soft tissue is closing that space but why i repeat always the same pr uh, principle the principle is physics and i can understand that no den dentist liked physics in school i didn't like it at all it was physics oh my god but the physic says that two objects can't occupy the same space finish that's the truth okay if i have a transmucosal occupying the space or the supracrest of occupying the space at the crest i can't expect that there will grow a papilla because the papilla needs a base, which is called bone. It's not called titanium. It's not called implant neck. And here we are. You see the bone? 
over the neck, bone over the neck. And this says the real uh, biological width, which was changed now, it's, it is called differently because if in effect uh, on, on uh, standard implants, there are no biological width. There are never a biological width because the width wasn't there because the implant is taking that width, that space. Imagine this implant has a transmucosia. We would not have all this space here, all this bone for that kind of papillas. We would not have them. That's an important principle, mostly for perios. <clears throat> and here we are, what happened? Five years control and look what happened with the periodontal lignum. You see, we have more space between the implant and the periodontal ligament as when we place this implant. And what happened is there were a slight movement with the compression very slowly. The periodontal ligament says, okay, you know what? Uh, there is some, something else now there uh, and I should move in another direction. And as testimonial, for that, so I'm working for, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased and I'm happy that I met in my professional life, Professor Dr. Rolf Evers from the University of Vienna, who is actually retired, but he was the greatest of the maxillofacial surgeon ever. He trained plenty of maxillofacial surgeon. Everybody knows him because I was traveling around with him around the world. And every, every, every maxillofacial went at least one time to visit him, if not to make a, 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 their postgraduate uh, program at the University Hospital in Zurich, in, excuse me, in Vienna. And there in Vienna, they did also that the tests that was before uh, the Vienna area. But uh, uh, what they, they were looking at is this uh, Cinto screws, which are really not screws. You see, there is no real screw. Uh, and they were tapped in, they were not tapped into, into the bone after opening a little hole at the cortical. And then they were tapped in. And what happened is they did it on on dogs, and here we see what happened. Whether let's see the the tapered pins were placed for osteosynthesis. The periodontal movement moves, moved. The tooth was intact. With the tooth, nothing happened. Uh, but the periodontal move, uh, ligament said, "Okay, you know what? We don't have space there." Let's go and change our direction. And this is what in uh, early 1918, Professor Avers demonstrated. And this from there came all this idea. When I saw that, I said, oh my God, okay, we can do it. And it is doable with the right and proper technique and with following the right principles of locking taper, press fit implants, and not of screw retained supracrestal or transmucosal implants. Sometimes we have to change our philosophy to achieve that that uh, result. So don't rely always on on the same things. I would, for example, for zircon uh, and zigoma implants. Yeah, by con forget it. Yeah, okay. I use Zigoma implants, the good ones. No? It's normal uh, that there is a limit for all kind of uh, designs. And so um, this design allowed us to do that in an easy way, in a very predictable way. So thanks for listening. And this is what the principle of bicondental implants is, is building success with long-term results. And in Rome, we have testimonies of that, like here, the Pantheon stays there for almost 3000 years and is still one of the best built buildings worldwide, survived hundreds of earthquakes.
thanks for listening and i'm waiting for some questions if there are some martina yes thank you so much for the wonderful session uh you can all the participants you can leave your question in the question answer box i will give a brief introduction about dentist channel online so i will be sharing on my screen Dentist Channel Online is a one of the largest and leading dental media company that aim to awareness knowledge regarding various aspects of dentistry. Uh, we conduct regular webinar courses on different area of dentistry. Being a prime member of Dentist Channel Online, you um, <coughs> online communities. You can Facebook, so you will get more information of Dentist Channel online. Please do follow us on Instagram. Being a prime member of Dentist on uh, Dentist Channel, Dentist Channel will be entitled to participation certificate that uh, contain 30 so if you have still you are not a part, uh, prime member you have to log into our website and please do uh, do the procedure and you can get 30 cpd point for every single webinar and you will be awarded with one Sorry for the inconvenience. Dr. Martina Thomas has lost her connection. I'll be playing by con implants from more video. Thank you so much, Mr. Siddiqui. Uh, all participants, you can add your question in the question answer box. Uh, doctor? Hello? Hello? Thank you so much for the participation. Keep updated. We will be coming tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you so much for the time.